Hi, my name is Kamran Boka. I'm a pulmonary and critical care fellow at Henry Ford Hospital in uh, Detroit, Michigan. I'm going to be giving a talk on how to boost your systems-based practice. In other words, really how to stay current on medical literature and some what you might think is are unorthodox uh, ways on the internet. A lot of you may already know of these techniques um, of using the internet, such as uh, using Twitter to stay ahead on medical information, um, how to stay organized with um, cloud storage, and the concept of uh, free online access to uh, education or medical education, as it's come to be known over the last two years. Um, and I'll give a quick talk on um, favorite microblogs and websites of mine, including some apps and how really to stay focused in an age of information overload. Really, this, this talk came about after discussion with one of my attending physicians during rounds, where this question came up, the role of DDABP in the overcorrection of hyponatremia. Uh, one of the mid-level providers, uh, a, physician a physician assistant, excuse me, was basically uh, presenting this case um, with this relevant question in mind. And as she was presenting, I quickly looked up um, using Google um, this topic. And, and here is essentially a reenactment of, of me looking up that information in Google Chrome. As you can see, I'm typing in DDAVP in overcorrection, hypernatremia as the keywords in Google. Qu quickly do a scan of the hits that come up. If you notice, the first two are from PubMed. And as I'm scrolling through, I'm seeing websites, ResearchGate, uh, CCJM, and uh, there's one right there from uh, PubMed that I like. That's the second one, uh, second hit. So here it's from Clinical Journal of American Society of Nephrology, published in, published in 2008, so relatively um, recent. Uh, it's a free article. There's two links, PubMed Central. They both are advertising that they have full text available. I'm looking for the PDF version. I mean, I'm, I personally like to read my articles in PDF, but here you can see this is the full text on PubMed. I'm going to go back and see if I can pull up the PDF pretty quickly. Um, actually go to the, uh, the journal website itself. Um, this is taking a second to load. Overall, this experience was pretty similar in the hospital as it is, as it is here uh, illustrated for you. Okay, here we go. The journal site is up. Um, there it is, full text PDF. It opens up in a you know kind of early 2000s, an old school type of uh, uh, website framework. There's a button. There's I'm sorry, the window to save. 331 full dot PDF doesn't make any sense. So let's let's name this to something that I can that you can categorize and organize and pull up later. I usually don't save before, unless I tag uh, my uh, documents. It helps better organize, keeps you focused. Uh, when you're doing searches and you can always search by tags. Tags is a way to classify and uh, basically categorize uh, files that you save for easy access. Most browsers will save it uh, your, uh, your downloaded files in-app or you can do what's known as open and system browser on Mac otherwise you can open within your PDF viewer on a PC like Adobe Acrobat um, or a, an equivalent reader. The problem on PC is that uh, sometimes you do need full paid versions um, when it, we're in Mac with Preview, which is the supplied PDF viewer, you can and are able to um, highlight and have full capabilities of the PDF, which are shown here. So you can highlight, um, do different colors, and you can even uh, annotate as well, which uh, annotation is always fun because when you're studying, you can go through and um, essentially... Uh, write notes in the margins digitally and save them and they'll be accessible uh, at the next viewing and the next time you pull it up you can even you can email the PDF send it out and it'll, it'll have your notes available it's good for proofreading it's good for revising these kinds of techniques so it is a, a good strategy um, to use so as you can see there are a lot of clicks there um, basically just to get the PDF um, it's it it took a while to go to the websites and actually pull up the PDF, but my my attending physician noticed that, and he looked at me, asked me one question, and he said, 
actually he actually paused rounds and asked this and he said uh, do you use Google for your primary literature search when you're looking for medical articles well I thought this was a loaded question I look at him and I essentially said yes I quickly said yes because that's that's one thing that I remember from medical training is uh, you know you don't you don't do your searches on Wikipedia you don't do your searches on, on uh, Google search and why is that well they're not validated they're just not validated sites to use um, you know studies have actually shown that um, physicians and medical and even uh, junior doctors and, and medical students are not well versed in in researching and looking up stuff on even engines like PubMed which I'll get into but the idea of medical informatics is, is important how do we how do we share information how do we look up information that's important this is actually from Wikipedia Wikipedia can be a great source when used appropriately and clinical informatics is concerned with the use of information in healthcare by clinicians there it is right there the first line um, the idea of pulling information together when necessary when needed is what this is all about and that's really the basis of this talk the concept of validated searches is something that's it's people are people are looking into investigators are looking into this is an article from 2013 um, just last year that where three investigators looked at Google Scholar uh, as a standalone in in doing a primary literature search so what they did was is they looked at 29 systematic review articles now these articles were published in either the Cochrane database or in Journal of American Medical Association in 2009 they used they used review articles because you each review article in medicine and these 29 articles span the gamut of medicine uh, they start off with the given knowledge that each review article would contain um, many many citations many works with an exhaustive works referenced or a, a bibliography and they took all of these hundreds and hundreds of references at the ends of these um, at the end of these uh, articles which numbered around 738 or so um, studies and they put them in what they called a gold standard database so they put all of these in one location on the web and some of these some of these uh, studies were in lockdown journals and it's with which would require a uh, subscription only um, um, membership and username and passwords uh, for access for the full text but nevertheless they did this and then one by one they they plugged all of these into Google Scholar and the question was uh, how well could Google Scholar retrieve all of these articles We're essentially trying to justify validation Interesting enough, all the 738 original studies included in their database were retrieved from Google Scholar. You know, like I said, it's been taught that Google should not be used in isolation, and specifically Google Scholar even should not be used in isolation. And this is what this is one of the, the givens that they went in with, but their studies really or their study really showed otherwise. 100% uh, of the articles were retrieved. And that essentially means that if the authors of these 29 systematic reviews of these review articles had used only Google Scholar they would have obtained the very same results I mean that's great that's great I mean that's great for people like me I'm a medical app developer and I've created a flat my own flagship product uh, Boca's Notes Internal Medicine uh, you can check it out at bocasnotes.com the only reason that I'm plugging this right now is that I've created a set of marketing tools uh, which basically inform uh, people interested in my product, which is essentially an on-call guide for students, medical residents, um, rotating and studying internal medicine residency. Um, but this is a means, a, a way to learn. Um, it becomes it becomes important when doing. We all know how to use Google. We all use Google. We all get on it and we we search these search engines um, quickly because these keywords. Um, are referenced and everything is pulled up so quickly a quick Google search can answer most questions um, and didactics and classroom study are not the only ways to learn I mean that's why you're on YouTube right now that's why you're checking out the slideshow you know 
Nowadays, especially as a physician, especially as a young learning physician, whatever stage you're at, medical student, intern, resident, um, fellow like me, or even beyond attending, um, it's not about what you know anymore. It's really about how you can access that knowledge quickly for your patient, um, because ultimately it's about patient care. Primum non nocere. Remember, do first do first do no harm. And in order to get to that point, we have to be able to know how to access that information. Problem is, there's just too many resources out there. There's too much information. Um, we we have too much information coming at us and we don't know what to do with it and that's what the fear is and that's what a fe the fear that a lot of physicians have and that's the fear a lot of learners have in medical education because this is a fact dr gold is a, is a cardiologist that has has referenced on the internet um the half-life of medical knowledge is seven years ever since he said that in that conference it's blown up on the internet and twitter and and, and social media academic circles and and the idea is that Everything you learned in med school, count seven years forward, count a decade forward. That it, what happened to that information? Well, it, a lot of it, about 50% of that is put into question. It's either outdated or it will be outdated or it's being shown in trials to be otherwise. So how do we stay current on all this medical literature? How do we refresh what we know or what we think we know or what we learned seven years ago, which may or may not be true now. So how do we how do we avoid being that clinician that becomes so busy with day to day life, with that with the pressures from insurance companies, from from their group, from the hospital, from their teaching program, uh, from even their family and uh, expectations at home, and other and other uh, non job related stressors, uh, which we all go through. And how is he able to maintain a healthy diet, sleep, and maintain social relationships, and keep up with everything in light of this information overload that we're all worried about. How, how can we do this? Um, well, the concept of social media has exploded to the point where now people online are saying that it's not just about information overload anymore. It's about being, being able to filter that information, knowing how to filter. We used to go into, a, we used to go into libraries with a question in our mind, an academic question, we'd walk in and we'd either help ask the librarian or we'd look it up on the uh, rudimentary computer systems back then, or even Dewey Decimal System, back, whatever, card catalog. We'd go through and we'd try to figure out what's the answer to that question. We'd pull that book and we'd pull the knowledge out of that book. But that's not what happens anymore. Now information surrounds us. It's on, it's on our devices. It's beeping and vibrating and, um, on, on the, from the apps on our pockets, push notifications information is pushed to us through email, through daily digest, digitally. It's there. So now they're just a bunch of answers. So it's up to us to have that passion for the question. We have to formulate the question. And we can only formulate the question if we have a system, if we know how to organize the crazy chaotic data around us for it so that it makes sense. It's not about the push. I'm sorry, it's not about the pull, but it's but it's about the push. Podcasts are an underestimated and overlooked part of that organization that's very efficient and a suggested method on my part for you to use. If you're in internal medicine and you know, with you probably doing an internal medicine pulmonary or critical care search right now, you came across this video and if you're about 16 slides in, you're probably focused on this, but New England Journal puts out a great podcast, NEJM, NEJM this week. These are small downloadable MP3 files you just put on your device, plug into your car, listen to on the drive to work or on the, or on the way back. If you don't have the focus during rush hour, you listen to it on the way to work. If you want to know what's going on in critical care medicine, Society of Critical Care Medicine puts out a great one, I Critical Care. And then if you're into the foam movement, which is what I'm going to get into, free online access to med medical education, Rage podcast does wonders. So a lot of people have trouble getting into the concept of learning online, of learning in a non-peer-reviewed fashion. So these are words that, that need to be addressed. You know, vocabulary needs to be built. MESH, for example, medical, uh, medical subject headings is a way that PubMed indexes uh, files and pulls. If you don't, not familiar with mesh, then you you know you're you're 
you, you need to you need to educate and you need to learn how to effectively search on on PubMed. Um, learn how to organize. Use the cloud. Learn what a hashtag is. You know, get involved with Twitter and learn how to organize and categorize your your PDFs that you saved your either to the cloud, which I recommend, or to your local machine or to your local device. You know, iCloud is just you know, iCloud is just one type of cloud, and it's not a great way to efficiently save data, but it's really more for uh, a, a way that Apple syncs. But things like Dropnote, a Dropbox, and Evernote are great cloud storage devices. Podcasts we discuss. So hashtags and at symbols, these are, this is Twitter. This is essentially Twitter. But remember, as professionals, we think, you know, a lot of us think that Twitter is just a bunch of crazed teenagers, you know, wasting time tweeting at each other, sending worthless 140 character or less uh, messages back and forth, which don't really add up to anything that are just, you know, talking about the latest celebrity and the latest gossip. Well, it's more than that. This here is what you're, uh, what you're seeing here is my Twitter page, my current Twitter page. So the large picture across is just your background photo. Um, the, the, tiny, uh, the tiny square uh, picture is my avatar, or it's your uh, fo uh, profile photo, in other words. And then you have your name, and underneath in gray with the at symbol, at Dr. Broker Joker, is my username. Um, or uh, in, in Twitter speak, it's your handle. Um, you always need the at sign in front of a person's handle, and that's the uh, way that Twitter indexes and prefixes every uh, usernames. Um, if you have a topic of discussion, that's what's in blue there, that hashtag foam. So that's in my little uh, profile, which is underneath. Artist, lung and ICU doc, medical educator, hashtag foam, med, uh, free open access med med education. Fitness freak, draws and blogs at vagalthoughts.com. Vagalthoughts.com is my... Um, medical and art blog and below bocasnotes.com is my uh, internal medicine app so as you can see uh, moving across from my profile avatar there's tweets 1332 so relatively fresh to the twitter game there's people up in the 67,000 range um, of tweets um, those are cute one hour tweeters uh, but uh, nonetheless very engaging people um, Photos, videos, uh, following is how many how many Twitter accounts that I'm actively following. Two hundred forty eight followers is how many uh, people are following uh, my account, um, and two hundred forty nine is how many favorited tweets that I've that I've engaged in. Um, there's always a who to follow column on the right, and then the tweets is what you see in the center. There um, is essentially. Uh, I guess it's analogous to the wall on Facebook. Um, I encourage people to get involved on Twitter. As, as a physician, there's a great deal of information to be learned. There's a, there's a beautiful academic discussion going on on Twitter. There are six rules that I recommend uh, if, if you were to get involved on Twitter. I think you need to be honest. You need to be honest with yourself, with the information that you post, as well as um, the the information that you engage in by being honest it portrays a sense of trust and it, it, trust is something that we need on the internet and it's 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 easy to to hide and that leads to number two it's it's easy to be anonymous online it's easy to hide and that's why I say to use your name Kamran Boca comma MD by saying that I'm you build credibility uh, number three obviously never use patient identifiers uh, we live in an age of privacy and security uh, despite the uh, paradoxical uh, openness and publicness of our social media, but uh, we always want to protect our patients and the confidentiality of that patient-physician relationship. Always maintain that and, uh, and respect patients' uh, uh, rights and ethics and uh, laws, of course, like HIPAA. So number four, be passionate about what, we, about what you tweet. Remember, people want to read what's engaging and interactive, and they don't want to learn about your um, your per, your necessarily your personal likes, but you know the the time that we spend online is valuable to us, so we want to learn, and so that's what number six is. Be sure that there's learning in your tweet. But I think number five is the the most important, and it's summed up here. 
Uh, all, I think everything else is summed up in number five, but to think before you tweet. Remember, there's a, there's a digital trail online, uh, just like there is on your EMR. So be cognizant of that, and, and you'll have a more fun time doing this. PubMed's already, uh, if you do a quick search, if you just type in Twitter, um, in Medline or PubMed or even, I don't, I'm not sure about Cochrane Review, but you're going to start seeing Twitter popping up. You know, this is an emerging technology. It hasn't, it's only been around for uh, not even a decade yet, but it's, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's growing and it's starting to show, starting to show that in medical circles. Here you have two accounts that I follow. On the left is Pulmonary Critical Care Medicine's uh, microblog, Pulm CCM. And this is a great Atlanta-based um, website, uh, pulmccm.org. If you're interested in pulmonary medicine, critical care medicine, if you're a fellow or a resident um, interested in this field or an attending that is, you know, boarded in, in one of these or both specialties, this is a great go-to website. It has, um, it, it basically has summaries of all the latest and uh, controversial topics in pulmonary critical care medicine from the journals. Um, great way to get engaged, and their uh, their Twitter account is active. Uh, American Thoracic Society on the right, of course, is the go-to one of the go-to uh, um, communities um, in our fields, and so thoracic.org, and so you know you can stay current with the uh, with the conferences. Um, ATS 2014 in San Diego that just I just passed the conferences. It, it, it was a great way to keep up. You know, I happened to be at my sister's graduation that weekend. Was unable to attend, and, but I uh, kept up a little bit with with the goings on um, via Twitter. So because of the live tweeting, which is a beautiful part of the conversation discussion of Twitter, the Twitter model. Amol Matu is um, is an ER physician that's uh, that's big on Twitter and with uh, has a lot of engaging conversations, and he gets into a lot of. Um, Academic discussions and uh, it's he's a worth worthy of a follow. Now, one of the concepts and one of the topics on my title slide was entitled "Free Open Access Medication." Now, this was a term Mike Cadigan, of uh, an ER physician in Australia, coined, um, or so the online discussion goes. Um, my apologies um, if that is not true, but I do believe it's true from all of my reading. I am a supporter of foam. Um, and that's what this uh, topic is, FOAM, um, moving forward, is that, you know, the paradigm model is shifting. Um, and over the past two years, it's been an explosion, a revolution, you could say, of learning online. A lot of microblogs have, have built up. And um, Twitter, for example, has, has gone forward with what we call serious medical conversations. There's academic discussions going on where you can engage in and 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 speak with other physicians in a real-time format um, pose a question people will discuss the data discuss their thoughts and opinions and their medical commentary and experiences and move forward from there and part of this is that there were a lot of physicians and medical educators that really oppose learning through social media especially medically and uh, Mike uh, Cadigan was instrumental in, in starting this foam movement and he he's branded it so we, we have to respect that and, and appreciate what he's done now one thing one thing that must be said is that this is not a way to replace peer-reviewed interpretation peer-reviewed articles the peer-reviewed process I believe is instrumental. I mean, there's people that don't believe in foam. There's people that 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 discount and discredit it. But even these guys, you know, you give them a chance, or they they, they give they give a chance, and they they see how it takes off. Um, Joe Lex said or wrote um, something very interesting. If you want to look. If you want to know how we practiced medicine five years ago, read a textbook. If you want to know how we practiced medicine two years ago, read a journal. If you want to know how we practice medicine now, go to a good conference. But if you want to know how we will practice medicine in the future, listen in the hallways and use foam. Now, not everybody agrees with that, but but if you if you the more you get into this online learning and you sup, use it as a supplement to the evidence-based practice, evidence-based medicine that we know, 
that we that we get through our journals, through our through our subscriptions, and that we practice and teach our residents and our and our and our students, and we engage in with our attendings, we find that by supplementing this information, we become much more engaged. We much become more much more passionate. Life in the fast lane is a ex beautiful example of a, of a, what I call a microblog, which is very proactive in the foam movement. Now these are emergency medicine and critical care educators and they they are they do wonderful bulleted um, and and quick short paragraph summaries and synopses of of different of different topics ranging from ultrasound to um, uh, procedural IV line placement to um, discussions of, of various journals the process trial uh, which which has called into account some of the metrics surrounding early goal-directed therapy um, <clears throat> Uh, Pulm CCM website here that I strongly advocate uh, at least book bookmarking give it a give it a read over and see at least if you don't necessarily agree with the way that uh, these these micro blogs um, do their writing style if nothing else at least it'll keep you abreast and tell you which topics you should be reading and then you can go to the source and decide for yourself it's very easy to um, to bookmark these sites, by the way, if you have an iPhone um, or an Android, um, you know you can you can essentially uh, save these as as desktop bookmarks, and they look like icons now with all of the uh, um, updated iOSs and updated uh, operating systems for both Android and iPhone. So the the user experience is pretty much the same. Two Minute Medicine, great little website um, for for doing quick reads and quick reviews. This is my personal site, vagalthoughts.com. Um, it's uh, it's a medical and art blog. I say art because sometimes I I uh, will post my <coughs> my my drawings up there for you guys. Um, but otherwise, I, I I try to stick with um, medical reviews here and there. Now, with all this information, it becomes very important to really try to create that filter for yourself and, and know where to get your information build a one-stop shop that's that's difficult that's difficult to do it's really hard every physician has um, has their way of looking up things whatever your field is um, it, the challenge is what is that one-stop shop for everybody and the problem is is that it, it differs and it varies and there's not going to be one place that you can go for everything and then be done with it we know that but for a lot of people surprisingly it's up to date but there's problems with up to date and that it can be wordy at times it can have too much information at times and sometimes with all the information and wonderful peer uh, I'm sorry with all the wonderful information it does give you in the end you may walk away thinking what was that information uh, was that was that really answering the question that I had and sometimes it doesn't um, so despite it being a peer-reviewed process and a wonderful go-to um, it, it may not be the answer for you at all times um, imedicalapps.com is one that I is a website by the way I recommend that you bookmark um, it's available. Uh, it's available on the web, and it, what it does is essentially reviews the top apps, the top medical apps, and, and varying specialties um, for Android uh, phones and for uh, Apple devices, uh, iPhones and iPads. Um, here I have an article pulled up. Docfin is your medical library journals all in one app. This was published. This uh, review was published in 2012. And they go over Docfin, which is really my go-to for uh, my my hub. It's my one-time login uh, for for all my journals, and it's how I stay current with my medical literature. It means uh, Doctors Personalized Health Information Network. That's where the name came from. And Mitesh Patel, uh, the co-founder and, and CEO. Um, um, created this after having difficulty um, in his early medical career as a trainee trying to decide um, 
how to fix the solution or how to fix the problem of too many logins and how to get to that PDF, how to get to that article, you know, and every, every physician is, is struggles with this, you know, even in, even working in large institutions, we, we have the capability, um, to access our libraries, um, through online and our libraries have access to 5,000, 6,000 journals. Um, but it's just, going through login and portal and, and clicks and, and we get clicker, clicking fatigue um, from all of the from all the all the hoops that we have to go through just to get to that full text article just to get to that journal I showed you in that first uh, um, I, I just showed you in that first um, video at the beginning of this talk of how how many hoops you have to go through but here you can see that docfin is highly rated it's um, it's touted as the best way to keep up with medical research. It's in the top ten on iMedical apps. Um, it's it it really is um, a wonderful tool, and I highly highly recommend it for students, for interns, residents, fellows, and attendings. And most definitely, I I, I advocate attendings staff to use this. Uh, program directors can even use it. There's new tools now for milestones and um, a way for them to keep up with ACGME um, requirements um, for their trainees, including reports, reviews of competencies, reviews of um, of board prep quizzes. So program directors can track progress and and reports and questions and and this this is a section that I thought was very interesting and and one that I uh, s tried to sell to my division is holding journal clubs uh, through Docfin and this is something that I think we're gonna we're gonna start looking into is, is how that process works of how we can all stay interactive almost in a Twitter like fashion but through a closed system like Docfin um, and if your hospital doesn't have access to Docfin if you if it's not um, what if if there's no licensing agreement then you can become uh, essentially an ambassador so you can you can go and 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 communicate with your library and email um, Docfin support and they're they're very timely and very uh, quick to respond if you do have medical apps or if you're in the medical development, they also have uh, a developer uh, AB API as well, which is a, a little more advanced discussion, but, but they do. Um, creating a Docfin account is actually very easy. You just go to the sign-up page, you type in your first name, last name, I'm a fellow, um, and or if you're, a, if you're an attending, then I'm a staff. You type in your uh, email address, uh, I'm a fellow, no mo. And your, uh, and you know, since you're, if you're, and then your, your full email, and then you create your password. The next thing you do is you just, you, by proxy, you select your institution. So, uh, you know, uh, since I'm at Henry Ford, you type that in, and then you go down to your, uh, your the field of training that you're in. So, the. The idea here is that you've already set up your journals by doing this. It'll it'll pull journals for you, and it'll pull, pull articles for you that are relevant to your field, and most likely you're already subscribed to. So you can pick more than one discipline. Um, so you can pick a primary specialty, critical care medicine in this case, and pulmonary otherwise. You agree to the term of service, and you hit submit. So this is what your dashboard looks like. You're going to start off in MedStream. MedStream is essentially the news, uh, latest news and latest trending um, uh, medical news and what's going on. And so in, in the, the gray rectangles, we'll say trending on Docfin. So there we've, I've clicked on a junior doctor's salary since for you cashologists out there. Uh, and then you can see that you can easily integrate these articles into an organizational scheme using uh, cloud services Evernote being one that I use and, and strongly advocate um, you can save them within Docfin and create folders here and you can cascade your folders um, there's a section called alerts based on your primary and your secondary specialties 
of what Doc Finn thinks, the stuff that you may want to read and stuff you may you may want to know, or he thinks that you should know. So this hones down the news even further and is more specific. So where you, where on the front page on the med stream, you may have articles like a junior doctor's salary, which may or may not be relevant to your clinical practice. Um, the alerts are probably going to be more relevant to your clinical practice. Um, so they're just a, a, a nicer way of, of saving time and looking. So if you're if you're interested in in something a quick keyword like pure phenidone, uh, which from the Ascend trial is a new um, which is a new medication for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, you can just do a quick search and you can see how quickly the PDF uh, came up. Now remember, I've only logged in one time with this. I I, I haven't had to go to my library access and do a remote login since I'm not at the hospital right now. Um, and you can even you can save you can save divide uh, these to to wherever you want. You can change the change the name again. Like I said uh, before, it's always a good idea to 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 save for something that you know you're going to remember. Ascend. Um, I usually categorize by by date first, by year, and then I put the uh, journal um, followed by a keyword that will help me remember what the article is, not necessarily the title. So Ascend trial for me. Is what I was I know I save my PDFs to Dropbox under what's called Palm Critical Care and that's how I do it. Um, of course, everybody has their own system, but this is one way that I advocate. Again, if you want to open in your system viewer or if you want to open in, um, you know, and the, Right there, what I was showing is the beauty of Mac is that you can integrate your Dropbox into your Finder and folder. Now, landmark articles, wonderful way of, of seeing the need-to-know articles for your specialty. And this is what DocFin does beautifully. You can copy all those articles and dump them into a folder um, and have everything viewable there. So here we're going to say PCCM landmark articles, saved a new folder. Oh, sorry, I've got to cascade it accordingly into the tree. Okay, save the new folder, and there it is. So it's under My Papers PCCM. So if, whenever I save a PDF in DocFin, it'll go into the appropriate location. If you're staff and you're no longer in training, this is a great way as an attending, once you're out, to uh, learn uh, to earn CME credits uh, once you're out of training. Um, you can even uh, email uh, your friends and refer your friends. Um, so that you know you can you can have access. If you're if you have an institutional proxy, then most most journal articles you're going to have access to for free. Um, but otherwise, if you don't, then you can always sign up uh, for a monthly membership. It's a it's a it's a great way to stay ahead. Um, the apps are wonderful um, for iPhone, iPad. Um, they do work very well. We recommend. Uh, downloading them and Android also does have its own app uh, as you can see so some people organize their data like uh, one of one of our one of our uh, colleagues at work one of my one of my pulmonary attendings um, has organized basically all of the MICU articles the medical intensive care articles and the pulmonary articles pulmonary on the right MICU on the left there on what's known as our shared drive in, in the hospital. This is a, cure, a secure lockdown um, drive, which has uh, all of these folders have anywhere from five to 20 uh, PDFs. So there's a wealth of knowledge here, but you know, it's on lockdown if you're outside of the hospital, you can't get to it. Uh, you can't get to it because it's not um, on any cloud service. And that's why I recommend organizing all of your data in the cloud. The beauty of of saving in the cloud such as Dropbox is that it's so simple. You can just go to Google, you can type in dropbox.com and from there what you're doing is you're creating a method okay so that you can sync all of your files across all of your devices at once all the time. So when you do that, you're, you, you've created a folder, you create these folders 
and pulmonary critical care is where I keep all of my PDFs relevant to pulmonary or critical care medicine. So I've organized them by date, and then next to the date, I have the journal name. So 1990, chest journal. You click it, it pulls up the PDF. This is the interpretation of cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and this is a beautiful algorithm which explains the difficult to interpret CPX or CPET or CPET, depending on how you learn to pronounce and abbreviate. Um, but it's right there. You know, you can you can you can access Dropbox from any website, from any device. Um, you can download the, um, the the PDF to your local machine. You can you can move it to a different device. It, you can see how much data you have left, um, and you can scroll down and um, let me see. I'm going to scroll down to okay. So. The Rivers Trial, the Emanuel Rivers Trial, which uh, revolutionized sepsis care and basically pro protocolized uh, through what's known as early goal-directed therapy, the PDF is available. I can I can log in from any device from the hospital. I can be in a coffee shop. I can be in another country as long as I have internet access, which is omnipresent now. We can look it up. ATS, ERS guidelines for interpretation of pulmonary function tests. If I want, to, okay, what's the severity index? Um, how do we grade? Um, obstructive lung disease, we grade it on the, based on the FEV1, right? So let's go down and see. Let's let's refresh. And what is this very severe? So very severe is less than 35%. So now I know. So see how quickly and easily you can get information, articles that you're constantly going back to and referring to, ones that you're telling your ref, your your residents. Um, what are the what are what do the guidelines say about cough um, in a patient that has a lung tumor? Well. Dr. Kuali, who's one of our well-known and uh, very, very well-respected uh, pulmonologists, has written this article, and here it is. I have it. I can look it up at any time. Um, the process trial, the ASCEND trial. Um, so, and then you can always go down here, look at how, how much uh, space you have. If you want to share this folder with other people, you can do shared. Actually, this is shared with some of my colleagues at work. Pulmonary board review. Um, go through and, and, and grab relevant uh, uh, PDFs. Very, very, very easy to use. With Mac, it integrates beautifully if you have a Mac. So once you have a Dropbox account, you just need to dr download the uh, Dropbox client uh, for your um, uh, for your Mac. And as you can see, those articles that we just pulled up, here they are literally in your in your files and already marked up so the 1990 chest interpretation of cardiopulmonary exercise study is available right there the yang tobin rspi study is right there the rivers trial 2000 is right there and these are the interpretation of pfts um, right there so it's all on your machine so i can be at home have my laptop, have my articles. I can be walking around the street. Well, hopefully not on the street. On the sidewalk, have your uh, Android device, have Dropbox open. Again, it syncs. If I make a change here, it will manifest on the server, and then I can see this on my dropdown. Recently changed, it'll show up. I added the Ascend trial three hours ago. It's just gonna show up on all my devices on Dropbox, and that's the beauty of the cloud. And that's why you need to get organized in the cloud. If you don't use Dropbox, there's other services you can use. Evernote is a great one. Evernote has the capability of tagging and also now doing a, a beautiful search of PDFs using keywords. You can also do post-it note uh, photography, which saves. You can also do uh, full PDF document photography, which saves. So you can take a picture of your documents, of your, of your physical paper files, and then it digitizes it and saves it into the cloud so you can always have that document. You can shred your paper and save on content and space and be, go green. Um, Evernote has a slightly higher learning curve, but I do recommend you explore that. If you do have any questions, I am available at Dr. Boker Joker on Twitter for questions. That's the at symbol D-R-B-O-K-E-R-J-O-K-E-R. 
on Twitter for questions. Uh, MedPageToday.com, great, great resource for staying current on, on uh, uh, medical education, and it has and they have a great simple uh, app for iPhone, iPad, and Android as well. It takes a quick second to get registered, and if you can see the top three heading, uh, new specialty CME, you can get continuing medical education uh, credits as well. Um, YouTube, don't underestimate the value of YouTube in medical education and academics. There's a plethora of information, very worthwhile educational videos by professors and medical educators on here, physicians who love to teach, uh, pharmaceutical companies who spend lots of money on animations that are very, very precise, very, very adept. If you're a pulmonologist or a learning pulmonologist and you're trying to figure out uh, uh, pulmonary function testing, if you're trying to learn bronchoscopy step by step, the anatomy, what the interior looks like, great way to learn. Ventilators, uh, if you're a, if a, a burgeoning uh, intensivist or if you're a, if you're an up-and-coming um, <clears throat> uh, a senior resident in the ICU and you want to wow some people in your attendings and do well for your patients and really get to know that ventilator then a great way to learn is, um, is, is to get on YouTube and uh, Eric's medical lectures is a great one to subscribe to by the way. Um, finally LinkedIn uh, LinkedIn.com is the, is the website um, great way to stay socially connected um, in a professional sense. So this is essentially the Facebook of uh, career advancement, and um, it's it, it's it's a great way to to network and 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 basically build your career patterns outside of uh, Twitter, which has a very informal feel to it, but is in its design and model. So thank you, and I hope you did learn something new today. Um, and I'm always open for feedback, so please leave comments necessary. Otherwise, I'll see you on Twitter, and uh, happy learning.